You can turn in your Bible to John chapter 21. I'm going to do a message here. It's going to be a kick at myself. And probably some of you out there are going to get kicked with this one too. And the title, as you can see from the description thing, is Lessons Learned from False Rapture Date Setting. Um, I think all of us have fallen for the excitement that is generated many times when you start to hear about September the 23rd and look at this sign and look at that sign and all these different signs that could point to the rapture possibly happening on May the 12th or September the 23rd or the year 2011 because it'd be the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible and therefore and on and on and on. Uh, I know I've fallen for that uh, many times. And it's not because I'm trying to um, do some kind of a sin according to Scripture or something like that or, or whatever. I'm trying to falsely predict dates. That isn't it. It's uh, I'm anxious to see Jesus Christ. And I know that's why a lot of you out there have thought the same thing. I wonder if it could be 923 or something. You know, it's easy to get caught up in that. And um, the Lord's really been convicting me over this thing because... Uh, uh, for the majority of my ministry, I've been a single man. Uh, I got married for the first time when I was 36 years old. And uh, so for a long time, I kind of lived like Paul, the Apostle Paul. And when you're a single man and you don't have a wife or family, you know, depending on who you are out there, uh, when you don't have that to take care of, um, you start to get very much tired of this world. And you just kind of, you, you're serving the Lord, yes, but you're thinking about, yourself and you're like you know uh, what's the point of, of being here on this planet I'd much rather go to be with the Lord and you see that with the Apostle Paul he's have he's you know having a desire to depart and be with Christ which is far better you know for me to live as Christ and to die as gain you see that thing so rapture date setting becomes very attractive at that point and uh, you know when you get married or when you have children um, people like that you know you all of a sudden, things start to change a little bit, you know, and you, and you start to really have to reevaluate those beliefs and those feelings, and you have to start to say, you know what, I have a wife to take care of. Or if you have children, you can say, I have children to take care of. You know, there are responsibilities there that you cannot forsake. And so, um, you know, this, this has really been weighing heavily on me because I've, I've, uh, definitely it's come through with a lot of my preaching in the past and I'm not going to go back and take videos down and things like that you know it's I, I'm one thing to learn about me is I'm very real I don't try to hide things uh, you know I try to be as honest as I can and so I'm not going to if I've messed up in previous sermons I'll correct it in future ones and uh, you know I'm still looking for Jesus Christ I'm still anxious to see Jesus Christ I'm not backing off on that I'll never back off on the Pre time of Jacob's trouble catching away. Not going to back off on that, but uh, you know, just this thing of sort of my attitude towards being here on the earth. Uh, there's work to be done, and we're going to see that in this study. John chapter twenty-one, verse twenty it says here. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said. Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? No, John was the one that said that. So John identifies himself not by name, but by description here. Peter looks and he sees John and he says, what about him? Uh, verse 21, Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, what and what shall this man do? Jesus had just prophesied what was going to happen to Peter in his, in his later age. And he says, Peter looks and he says, what about John? Verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Very interesting statement there that Jesus makes to Peter. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. And up in verses 15 through 17, he says, 
feed my sheep over and over and over again. And there's no agape phileo Greek myth thing there. Don't fall for that. You can see Sam Gipp's book, uh, The Answer Book, to debunk that whole thing. Agape and phileo are used interchangeably. And it doesn't, it's not one is not a friendly love and one's more of a intimate love or whatever. No, 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 no. Don't fall for that. That's a lie. Um, they're used interchangeably throughout the New Testament. But the point is, Jesus says to Peter, hey, what my plans are basically for John, and John pictures the church, I believe. You read in the book of Revelation, John is caught up, you know, which we're going to be getting into here in this study. But, you know, you see this thing there where Peter is basically being told, don't worry about it. Follow thou me. And, you know, that's really the big problem with this whole false rapture date setting thing because what ends up happening is you start to say, well, what is this here and what is this blood moon and what is this particular date and if we would time it from such and such a verse to such and such in this year here and that year here and that and if it and Lord's up there going, what is that to thee? He has it planned out. So what are we supposed to do? Follow thou me. Meaning Jesus, not me. You know? We're to follow the Lord. We're to do His will. And I'll tell you right now, you can get very unfruitful when you start to think that the rapture is going to happen in a week from now or something like this. When you start to set a date for the rapture, you start to become unfruitful. I've been through it quite a few times. It starts to change you and you start to think to yourself, wow, what, what would happen if it, you know, this, this really could. And you know, a lot of times you'll start to tell other people. You'll start to say, now, I can't say it totally for sure, but I think the rapture is going to happen. You better get saved because the rapture could happen in September on the 23rd. It could. You know, and you end up looking like a fool because it doesn't happen. You know, I remember this whole Harold Camping thing back uh, May, what was it, May 21st or May 12th? I can't even remember, but 2012. And this Harold Camping false prophet came out and he was getting all these people. They were selling their homes and driving around the country with their cars painted up, you know, Mark the date, you know, it's going to happen. And it wasn't even the preacher of rapture, by the way, that he was, you know, proclaiming. He was actually saying it's the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, the end of the tribulation. Uh, the guy was a wing nut. Uh, I don't believe he was a saved man. I, you know, I, I read one of uh, previous videos back about Harold Camping. I read his salvation page, and it was like hyper-Calvinism. I mean, just like nutty, just crazy, his uh, plan of salvation. It was like, you know... Repent, and hopefully if God, you know, appreciates your repentance, then he might grant you salvation if you're one of the elect, and if you're not, well, then you wasted your time. Or I mean, it was like, okay, <laughs> really crazy. But the point is, there were a lot of people that went out and were proclaiming this thing of a false rapture date. And what happened afterwards? They looked like fools. And I bet you a lot of them don't even profess to be Christians anymore led astray by a false prophet with a false rapture date, and they fell away. Next, we're going to go to Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should look for signs and wonders that would show the exact date of the rapture. Oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't say that. It says, uh, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? See, they at this point in time, the, the catching away of the bride of Christ was still a mystery to them. We're going to see that later. I'm going to prove it from Scripture. And so they're saying, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Look what Jesus says. Verse 7, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, 
But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. All right. So, again, when's, when's it going to happen? When's the, when's the kingdom going to happen? Jesus says, don't worry about it. There's work for you to do. Hey, when, between you and me, when do you think the rapture is going to happen? Don't worry about it. There's work for you to do. There's work for me to do. There's still work to do. I'll tell you a little story real quickly to kind of illustrate my point. I used to be a cook on a train, Strasburg Railroad, down in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And uh, I would cook on this train. They called it the dinner train. And, and uh, they would have this the dining car thing. And, and you, you know, I'd cook throughout the day. And then also the, the bigger meal at the end, it was this big thing. And they, you know had uh, live entertainment and stuff. A guy would come and sing folk music and whatever else, and they'd have a big full course meal. And, I mean, it was a pretty fancy uh, thing that they would do there. And I was like the assistant to the head cook, and sometimes I was even the head cook, depending if somebody was there. And I was a teenager. So, you know, um, I worked really hard, and, and they put me in a decent position of authority. But uh, I had a higher position than a lot of the other young teens that worked there. But you know what? At the end of the day, it didn't matter what my high position was, so to speak. Uh, I was usually the one that ended up mopping the floor. There was work to be done. And even though I was, quote unquote, whatever, you know, in a, in a decent position, it was still my job, whoever was the last one out, to finish mopping the floor. And you know, as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, we have, we have great things that they did not have in the past. We can, we can hold the Word of God in our hands. I mean, here's my Cambridge Bible that I use all the time. This is my uh, oldest one that I've had. Uh, there are Bibles, I mean, you can get pocket-sized Bibles, Bibles online. You can get all kinds of different Bibles. I mean, we are, we are very blessed to have God's Word so readily accessible to us, to have, you know, sermons that can be viewed anywhere in the world, you know, you can translate them in other languages or whatever. I mean, we are very blessed. We have a pretty good position with the Lord. And we are, you know, His children, of course, salvation. Speaking of salvation, you know, we have the same salvation that Christians had in the past. But, you know, it's a, it's a great thing. I mean, we are child of, children of the King. It's a great thing. But uh, you know what? There's still work to be done. We, uh, as we are in this end times... And I'm going to be talking and proving that here in just a little bit, that we are, in fact, in the end times. But um, there's still the, uh, some things to mop up. As things are getting worse and worse and worse, we're going, it's got to be soon. The rapture's got to be soon. we got to be getting out of here sometime. But you know what? There's still some people that need to be saved. Because when the body of Christ is complete, and I do believe this, I believe firmly that the real timing of the rapture is going to be when that last soul is saved. When the body of Christ is complete, only the Lord knows when that time is going to happen. When His mercy is finally going to be okay, that's it. And it's not because they were predestinated and pre-elected before the foundation of the world or something like that. No, no, no. The Lord knows. He can see. I mean, He's, he's not in time. He's in eternity. So He knows when that last person is going to get saved. And, you know, by their own free will... He knows that. And when that happens, we're leaving. And so, what's the best thing that we can do? Set dates for the rapture or try to win people to Jesus Christ? Try to be diligent about the things of the Lord. Try to keep ourselves unspotted from the world in terms of falling away and things. Making sure that we're reading the Word. Making sure that we're listening to the right kind of music and dressing the right way and watching the right things and all the all the things that we're supposed to do our sanctification very 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 important and i'll tell you what when you start this falling for date setting and date setting and date setting you get that oh, it's going to be tomorrow oh it didn't happen again 
Oh, it's going to be next year? Oh, it didn't happen again. That gets old after a while. And pretty soon you're you're not doing this and not doing that. And I mean, there's there's been many times I've just, I've put projects to the side because it's just like, it could be the rapture. I think it could be this time. This date really looks like it could be the one and I think it could be. So I'm not going to bother fixing this or I'm not going to bother fixing that. And I'm just going to work overly hard, you know, seven days a week or something like this, you know, and, and, and I've done that. <laughs> I mean, you've seen in some of my older videos, I'm just like tired and things, just pushing, pushing too hard. You know, why? Well, mostly because of false rapture date setting. I've fallen for it. I mean, I will admit I've been guilty of that. I'm going to show you that there is a guilt thing there. But anyways, <laughs> the point is, in the book of Acts, Jesus Christ, before he goes up to heaven, the last instructions he gives is, hey, the Holy Ghost is going to come and i got work for you to do. And these two angels, when he goes up, the two angels are standing there going, why are you looking up to heaven? You know, you got work to do. Go get to work. And they do, of course. But you say, well, I don't know. Turn in your book, ugh. turn your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 9. If I can get my tongue to cooperate here. Um, you say, but... How do you know that, you know, there this rapture thing, you know, maybe it's, you know, how do you know that things are really timed out, that the Lord really has things timed out? I'll show you. This is, this is a key scripture to show you that God does have everything planned. Revelation 9, verse 15 says, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of man. Men, excuse me, men. So that's into the time of Jacob's trouble. And God has that thing planned out to the exact hour and day, year, month. He has it planned out. You say, well, then he has the exact hour, day, year, month planned of the rapture. Well, again, see, he's in eternity. He can see from beginning to end. So he knows when it's going to happen. But down here, we don't know when it's going to happen. You know, and so for us, we're going, you know, uh, shouldn't it have happened on September the 23rd? And, you know, this is just a theory, but could it be that it could have happened on September 23rd if those people had been witnessed to that are going to, that still need to get saved? Could it be that we are still here at this late hour because we've been doing a really bad job of, of not witnessing? Or we've been, yeah, that makes sense, you know? Hmm. You know, you do, you look at the world and you're just going, you know, <laughs> what is the Lord waiting for? I mean, shouldn't it be happening or something? There's still work to do. That floor still needs to be mopped. You know, some uh, dirty work has to be done. Getting out there and getting people yelling at you and things like that and witnessing to people and things. Uh, it can be tough at times but uh, getting back to my uh, sermon here how do we really know for sure that we are in the end times because you know you start to think that after a while these false rapture date setting things they, they they fail and they fail and they fail and sometimes these doubts will come into your mind and you think to yourself are we really in the end times do we really know for sure that we are in the end times let's look about that turn first to Matthew chapter 24 I'm going to show you a very strong proof. You say, people say, there's no proof for the pre-trib rapture. Well, if you want to be technical about it, uh, the term pre-trib rapture is not a Bible term. And, you know, tribulation is never given as a title. It's just a description, as I've said many times. So it's, it's some little word games going on there. Because if you say, well, uh, I don't believe we're going to go through the tribulation. People say, yes, but the Bible says Christians have tribulation. So blah, blah, blah. See, that's why I'm trying more and more to eliminate that word, the tribulation, because it's not a, a scriptural term as far as a title for the time period that's coming. Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble. Yes, those are biblical terms. The tribulation, the great tribulation, no, those are not biblical terms. But uh, I'm going to show you proof here 
a really good proof for the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. We're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 3, it says here, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Uh, the TNIV took out the word Christ, and they say, I am the Messiah. Uh, the word there, Christ, is Greek, Christos, and Messiah is from the Hebrew. And there is actually a, a verse that talks about, uh, that actually has the word Messiah in the New Testament. But this is not one of them. And you say, well, what's the big distinction? Christ and Messiah are very similar. They mean, you know, the anointed or whatever, the anointed one. I'm aware of that. But you see the word Christ is put in there for a very important reason. If you've never heard this before, it's very important that your King James Bible has the word Christ. Why? Because every Roman Catholic priest is called, in the Catechism, they're called another Christ. The Pope himself is another Christ. They'll tell you that. Christ on earth, basically. So, and you know, there's other people too that, that try to call themselves Christ. And what are, they, what are they doing? They're deceiving many. So, do we see this sign taking place? Yes. Deception is at an all-time high. It's never been so much deception in the world as there is right now. But let's continue with the other signs. Verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Are we seeing the things in verse 7 and verse, well, verse 6 through 7? Are we seeing those? Yes. You say, but there's always been war. Not like today. The 20th century was the most bloody century in all of history, all of recorded history. You know, incredible. World wars. Two world, excuse me, two world wars. Another one coming. I mean, you know, it's incredible. But verse 8 says that these are just the beginning of sorrows. See, I believe that we are in that time period right now. I believe this is the beginning of sorrows. It's going to get a whole lot worse when that time of Jacob's trouble comes especially. But, you know, the timing of the catching away of the bride of Christ in this time period, I have no idea. And neither does anybody else. So don't fall for these false dates. Verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. How many are going through that right now with your family members? Sure. Verse 11, And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Again, we're going through it right now. This stuff is happening. You say, then we're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. No, we're not. No, we're not. You're going to see that later on. But uh, jump down to verse 23. Here in Matthew 24, verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs, remember that, and wonders. Insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Remember Jesus said just a few verses earlier that false, you know, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. He's repeating it. False Christs. False prophets. Yeah. Verse 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Behold, he is in Siberia as Vesarian, the demented Russian Antichrist. <laughs> Believe it not. Uh, you know, I'm not adding to the scriptures there. It's just had a little say a little thing there from one of my videos I did. Uh, verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, thither or there will the eagles, eagles be gathered together. Reference to Revelation chapter 19. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, see, you see it as a description there, not as a title, 
Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man, the sign again there, the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Okay? So we see that there are some very significant things that are going to happen. And of course, you read the book of Revelation, and you can see it broken down into a lot more detail than what Jesus is revealing here in Matthew 24. The events are going to be unmistakable before Jesus returns down to the earth. All right? Revelation chapter 19 is the second coming. It's, ex it's explaining what really happens in great detail. But it's also in Revelation chapter 6. They're not two different events. All right? Revelation is retelling and retelling and retelling a lot of the same accounts, sometimes in greater detail, some, sometimes in more of a broad overview of what's going to happen. Revelation chapter 6 is the time of Jacob's trouble from beginning to end. Revelation 19, and it ends with you know, the second coming of Christ in Revelation 6. And then it goes back and it starts to talk about the sealing of the 144,000 in Revelation 7. Revelation 19 is giving more detail about the second coming and why this thing of here in verse uh, 28, where, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. You read about that in Revelation 19. That is revealed more. Okay? Scripture with Scripture. That's how you rightly divide the word of truth. Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 19. We're going to be covering a lot of scriptures today. So here we go. Mark 13 verse 19. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days... No flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Talking about the Jews there, uh, that are chosen in that day. Uh, verse 21, And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all these things, or all things, uh, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall the, they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. All right? And it's, again, you could read Mark 13 compared to Matthew 24. It's talking about the same events. All right? But notice again that there are signs given before Christ's second coming. Signs. That'll be important later. Luke chapter 21. Another one of the accounts of the time of Jacob's trouble. A time when there will be great tribulation upon the earth. Luke 21 verse 7 through 11. And they asked him saying, Master, but when shall these things be and what shall... Or what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? There's that word sign again. Verse 8, And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, Divers places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Signs again. Jump down to verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Yeah, just let me stop there real quick. With perplexity. You know, it, it cracks me up some of the, the news reporting that they try to do to, co to try to cover up the weird weather and the earthquakes and everything else right now. They don't have a clue. I remember back years ago, it was like 
this all this weird weather was happening. I think it was like back in high school and they started to talk about this El Nino weather system and it just comes every once in so many years and whatever. Now it's like every year, oh, it's the El Nino you know, weather system. <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, sure, sure. You know, and, and this all the flooding down in South Carolina right now, it's like it's the worst in, that we've had in a thousand years and stuff like this. And, you know, I don't really know where they got those statistics from, but, you know, it wasn't exactly settled a thousand years ago other than just Native American people. But what is it? Perplexity. How do you think that these news reporters, these nutty news reporters, what are they going to do in the time of Jacob's Trouble? You know, the ocean becomes blood like the blood of a dead man and things, and every living creature dies, and, you know, a third of the trees is burned up, all green grass is burned up. How are they going to report on that? Global warming, I'm assuming. But, uh, incredible. Verse 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads. Now look at this. For your redemption draweth nigh. Well, why does he have to, why does your redemption have to draw near to you? Which is what nigh means. It is drawing nigh. If this is re referring to the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away of the, of the saints or as some of the nutty post-tribbers would say, well, this is the rapture. Well, this is where they go up. Why? Why does Jesus have to come nigh? Can he just call you, catch you up there? What's it talking about? It's talking about the second coming. The Jews at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble are fleeing when they see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Who's a reader? Let him understand. Let them in Judea flee into the mountains. See? The people that are in Jerusalem, when they see the Antichrist set himself up in the temple, which is going to be rebuilt, and they already have plans for it and everything else, it's, it's really amazing, the red heifer and all the other stuff. When people see the Antichrist setting himself up in that temple and saying, I'm God, now worship me. At that point, the Jews are supposed to take off for the mountains, run, get out there, and you know, the Antichrist is going to start to kill people and kill the Jews and really hunt them down. And at some point, he's going to go out now after the ones that have fled into the wilderness. And when you, you know, the Lord's given these signs here, when they see all these things coming to pass, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Jesus Christ is coming down at that point. But what is it that uh, precedes Jesus Christ's second coming? Signs. What did I read about Jews requiring a sign? Greeks seeking after wisdom? Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? I'm sure there's no connection there. And how about uh, Mark chapter 16 where it says about that they went out and confirmed the word with signs following? Uh, who were they going to at first? The Jews? The Jews require a sign. What is the book of Revelation? Signs. The time of Jacob's trouble. I know a lot of you that watch this channel frequently, you're probably going, yeah, we've heard this stuff before, but I just need to drive it home and drive it home and drive it home and drive it home. You know, and just keep nailing it into your head so that you never forget it. It's for the nation of Israel. Now, there will be a lot of Gentiles that get saved as well, you know, you read about that in Revelation chapter 7, a great multitude which no man can number, out of every kindred, people, tongue, nation. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of Gentiles that get saved too, but it's mostly for the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. And they require signs. And there will be lots of signs that precede Christ's second coming. Hmm. What about the book of John? Where is there an account of this, all the signs and the sun, the moon being darkened, and you know, stars falling and all, you know, then you see the sign of the Son of Man coming in clouds and things. Where's that at in the book of John? It's not there. In fact, the, the term signs only appears twice. Let's look at those. John chapter 4. 
John chapter 4, verse 46. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And we're not going to read the rest of the verses, or you can read that uh, if you're interested in the rest of the story. But, of course, it, the man's son was healed, and, and he figures out that, yeah, it was you know the time when Jesus said, your son's healed, that's when he you know, was healed. Pretty incredible story. But you see there, Jesus saying to this man, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Um, how, did you need to see any signs, Christian, before you believed? Before you put your faith in Jesus Christ? No. You came to God as a sinner. You came to God because your life didn't make any sense, because you're like, you know, I need to get saved. I need to, I want to know God. I want to know, I want to go to heaven when I die. So you came with belief. You didn't need to see signs. Who's Jesus dealing with here? Hmm. Interesting. But again, we aren't seeing signs for Christians. Let's go to the next reference, John chapter 20. John 20, uh, where am I at here? Verse 26. It says, And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. That's a good verse to use on a Jehovah's Witness, by the way, um, because they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. And so show, show them that verse, and then say, Why doesn't Jesus rebuke him? Because they believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel or some foolish nonsense. No, he says, my Lord and my God, and Jesus doesn't say, hey, whoa, wait, no, I'm not God. He doesn't correct him. You know why? Because Jesus is God. But let's continue. Verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. We have a special blessing as Christians today. Look at verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Interesting. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Hmm. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. John, who has the book of Revelation revealed to him while he's up in heaven. And, you know, some people say, well, John was called up there into heaven in Revelation chapter 4, but then he came back down and died of old age. I don't see any proof for that. I don't see any proof in my King James Bible that John came back down. I don't believe he came back down. You know what I think happened to John? You want to talk about time machines and time travel and stuff like that? I think the Lord took John forward in time to the rapture, the catching away of the bride of Christ. And, and he went up and he saw everything that we're going to see. Very interesting. But you see there, which ver, or verse 30 there, which are not written in this book. Why didn't John feel it necessary to write down the signs that Jesus showed? Could it be that, the, that uh, this is sort of a John is in type like the church? And the church doesn't need signs? Hmm. Very, very interesting. You say, but then I guess John didn't write anything about the end times? Oh, no, actually he did. Turn back to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Beginning in verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. 
But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. What happened in Revelation chapter 4? John looks up into heaven, and what's he see? A door. The door opens. What does John hear? He hears a voice speaking to him as it were a trumpet. What do we hear at the rapture? The trump of God. Again, I've covered this in many other studies, but you know these post-tribbers just kind of turn a blind eye to this whole thing and say, oh, there's no proof for a pre-trib rapture. There are no clear scriptures. Oh, there are tons of clear scriptures. But you see, the clear scriptures are only there if you have eyes to see. If you've closed your eyes and you, because you've uh, been led astray by the false date setting and things for the rapture, and you've fallen away and now you don't look for Jesus anymore, and you've given up and now you're looking for the Antichrist and for the New World Order and for the Illuminati to take over and martial law and everything else. And that stuff, a lot of that stuff's real, sure, whatever, you know. But uh, if you're looking at that stuff instead of looking for Jesus Christ, you're not going to see these plain scriptures because you're not looking for them. Verse 4, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable speak Jesus un, spake Je Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Does it say that about uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21? Does it say they don't understand? No, they understood that. Interesting. Verse 7, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in, up to heaven, like John did in, in the book of Revelation, and out, back down. Jesus comes back with his angels. We are the angels. They're in the book of Revelation, we're compared to angels. He goes in, takes us in, brings us out, and what do we find? Pasture. The millennial kingdom. The earth is restored like a garden, like the Garden of Eden. What better pasture than the Garden of Eden? You see? Verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I have a whole study on that. The post trib rapture thieves, that's exactly what they'll do. They will steal promises that God made to Israel. They will kill your joy. And they will destroy your crown that you get for looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Uh, I can testify that a lot of times when you're looking for specific rapture dates and everything, you're not really living an abundant life down here. If you saw last week's study or last whenever this was, you know, the how to worship God, um, the beauty of God's creation was created for us to enjoy and to give praise to our Creator, to our Heavenly Father. You know, a bunch of lost people that have no desire for Jesus Christ or have no desire for salvation, nature's not for them. All the intricacies of, of the flowers and the, and the mushrooms and the trees and the birds and the insects and everything else, it's not for them. You know, you know the, the great food that you can have down here and the, and the amazing things that God can bless you with, it's for us. That's abundant living. Well, let's continue. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own sh the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, hmm, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. How many hirelings in Babel buildings have caused the sheep to scatter? Yeah, I get this thing all the time. Well, you should find a good local church. Uh, maybe you ought to just wake up to that thing, to the Baptists out there and things like that. You know, find a good local church in your area. Um, there aren't any. I mean, even, even if you want to overlook the whole thing of the Babel building not being in Scripture and, you know, church buildings, 
even if you want to overlook that and say, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to get in good fellowship and whatever, there aren't that many out there that actually have a, a man in the pulpit that actually believes the King James Bible, overlooking the whole, all the political stuff with the church building issue and the little clickiness and all the other, you know, you come to church for the pageant on Sunday and all that stuff. Even if you just overlook that, there aren't that many out there that have people in it that are not going to cause you to compromise. You go to the average Babel building and that's exactly what it is. They babble, talk about television, they talk about the weather, they talk about hunting season, they talk about whatever. You know, and I'm not saying that, you know, hunting season's bad <laughs> you know, in the weather. That stuff's okay. But when that's all people want to talk about, and they don't want to talk about the things of the Lord and stand around and talk about scripture, that's a problem. But what's happened? Well, there's been a lot of hirelings out there and they have scattered the sheep. That's why we get contacted from sheep all over the world saying, I've been to every church in the area and there's none of them that are any good. That one's got a female preacher. That one uses new versions. This one's brought rock music in. That one there, it's just so clicky and carnal and whatever else, you know. I mean, I've gotten, I've heard horror stories, you know. This preacher here leaves his wife and, and marries, you know, a IRS agent woman, you know. Uh, this one here is, is having, you know, fornication with multiple partners. This pastor, you know, they're hirelings. They're scattering the sheep. And praise the Lord that the scattered sheep can still be in fellowship with the Lord. They can still, in their isolation, so to speak, away from all the other sheep, they can still be in good fellowship with the Lord. They can still watch sermons online. Praise the Lord for that. It's a wonderful thing. Let's see where am I reading to here? Okay, verse 14, let's continue. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Get a hold of that one. Okay, Jesus is talking to Jews, but he's saying, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Prophesying the future gospel going to the Gentiles. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. What do we read over in the book of Galatians? There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Isn't it interesting that this account of the end times here, this account of sheep going in and then coming back out to find pasture, isn't it interesting that there's no mention of signs and no differentiation between Jews and Gentiles? There's no, all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn. For the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Where's it at? It's not in there. Interesting. Verse 17. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. There was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings. Terrible, isn't it? And many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Are you still blind? Into, into thinking that Christians are going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble? Or are you starting to see that there's a difference there? Signs precede Christ's second coming. There are no signs in the heavens and signs and all this other stuff that precede the catching away of the bride of Christ, which we just read about here in John chapter 10. Oh, but I read a book and this guy's a scholar. and uh, Yeah, sure you did. Well, what about Paul? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Did Paul mention anything about signs? Paul, first, we'll see what Paul has to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Reading down through verse 58. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, 
for the Trump, and I don't mean Donald Trump either, so don't go there, you know. <laughs> for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always looking for signs until you see that... Oh, I'm sorry, I read it wrong again. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When you start to look for a date, I won't ask you how many. I'll ask for a show of hands, but I can't really see them anyhow, so it's kind of pointless. But uh, how many of you fell for the 923 thing? How many of you started to really believe this was it? Were you abounding in the work of the Lord? Hmm. I was starting to fall for it. Not because I'm looking, oh, well, I can predict the date and I can, and then I'll be right and people will remember me as a great prophet. No, 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 no. I wanted to see Jesus Christ. But you know what? The more I looked at that thing, the more I started to think, maybe there could be something to this. The more I was not abounding in the work of the Lord. And you know what part of my work is? It's to provide for my own. I'm a husband. I have a wife. And a lot of you out there, you have wives, you have children. Some of the work that you're supposed to do is to provide for them. And that just doesn't mean financially. That means take them out, show them God's creation. Give them a good life. You know, enjoy yourself once in a while. Go tracting, try to spread the gospel, sure, absolutely. But you know, God wants to hear from his children. He made everything down here for our sakes, you know, so that we can enjoy it. He'd like to hear some praise coming from that. But, you know, when you're thinking that the end is going to be two weeks from now, you start to kind of fall away from that. And again, I'm kicking you. I'm kicking myself. If you've been guilty of that, something to think about. But before we go to the next passage, I just want you to see here, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now that's a very, very key verse. And it's so funny to me because so many people that argue against the what they call the pre-trib rapture, they will avoid this verse like the plague. And they will especially avoid the, the one little word there that says mystery. They don't like that word. You see, if Paul was talking about the second coming, uh, it wouldn't be a mystery. It's already been revealed. Jesus Christ, when he was here on the earth, was talking about it a lot, the second coming. And all the uh, signs that uh, precede the second coming. Where are their signs at? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Did you see any signs in there? The sun being darkened, the moon not giving light, being turned into blood, and stars falling from heaven, and all the other stuff. There aren't any signs. No signs mentioned. Then maybe you think Paul might be talking about another event, not the second coming. Interesting. But let's go to the big one now. First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. This is the, the big one that people know about, you know, and everybody will say this is the one that's the pre tribbers will only be able to go here and then they try to debunk it. They never really succeed, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the only two times in your King James Bible that the trump appears. It's talking about the voice of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Yeah. Uh, you say, um, 
Well, that's, but see, that's described in Matthew 24. It's the same thing. Okay, well, I'd like to point out a few things. First of all, where in Matthew chapter 24 or, or Mark 13, Luke 21, where are there dead saints coming up? We see it there. Where are the dead saints that come up? They're not there. Now, you could probably find some satanic new version from the Vatican or something that would have it. But uh, the King James Bible? Nope, not there. That's a problem for you if you're uh, non-dispensational. But uh, the other problem, where are the signs? I mean, wouldn't Paul be kind of foolish not to mention all the signs that are written back in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Uh, wouldn't he be kind of lazy, perhaps, or something, maybe, you know, not mentioning that there are going to be these great signs before the coming of the Son of Man? Oh, but that's right. Paul doesn't ever use the term coming of the Son of Man. He uses Son of God. You know why? Because the Jews are looking for the Son of Man. They're looking for a descendant from David as their Messiah. Christians aren't looking for that. We don't need to see signs. John in his gospel did not write the signs that he saw. Why? John is, the book of John is primarily written before the crucifixion, of course, but John is recording things that are prophesying the future of the body of Christ. And, you know, I'm going to probably end up doing a, a whole study on the book of John eventually, not expository verse by verse, but getting into this thing of showing a lot of the verses that are pointing towards Christians, both Jews and Gentiles, being one. We saw some earlier there in John chapter 10. Interesting. But let's continue reading here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 now. Let's look for the signs, okay, because he gets into a little bit more detail. So I'm sure he's going to show signs and he's going to repeat some of the stuff in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. I'm sure it's going to be there. Let's just look for it, okay? Chapter 5, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Huh? For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Escape? Somebody's going to be escaping this time period? Oh yeah. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Another key verse there that disproves the whole thing of Christians going into the time of Jacob's trouble. It's wrath from beginning to end. And you say, well, yes, but the word wrath doesn't really appear in, in the verse, first part. Okay, what do you think, you know, unleashing the Antichrist on the world? War and death and famine and, you know, and hell. and things. That's not God's wrath, you know? post trevors are kooky. Uh, it's wrath from beginning to the end to the end there. And, you know, people that take the mark of the beast, they get God's wrath coming on them. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, you know, you go back to uh, Zephaniah, and it talks about, you know, God assembles the kingdoms to pour upon him his fierce indignation. When does that happen? At the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble? Verse 10, Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. See, it's a comfort to know that we're going to be leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. But it's also supposed to be edifying. There should be some exhortation there. We should edify one another, build each other up, but we should also edit, uh, exhort one another. You know, that's what I'm trying to do right now. And that's what the Lord has been doing with me. And, you know, I've been challenged by some of the brethren, too. And things we have work to do that's why we're still here you know you say what if the troops come and things like that you know what if what if there's a military takeover bigger congregation to preach to what if you end up going to a concentration camp somebody there needs to be saved why are we fearing men you know why do you think america has continued for so long
I've talked about this again in other studies, but seriously, why do you think we still have freedom in this country? Why do you think Christians haven't been slaughtered yet? You know why? Because there's still a lot of Bible believers out there. There's still a lot of work being done for the Lord. That's why the doors are still open here. We can still preach the gospel. That's why the doors are still open in other countries out there. Maybe not as much as here in America, but uh, I'll tell you what, we're still, we still got it pretty good. Stay busy. Okay, verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. You know, are you praying to see Jesus Christ come back? Something to think about there. We should be praying without ceasing. Not, oh, Lord, get me out of this rotten planet. No, Lord, give me an opportunity to witness to somebody today. You know, I'll be very, very honest with you. I've been a really bad witness. Uh, many times in my life, there were doors that the Lord opened, and I just kept my stupid mouth shut. But I've been trying to get better at that. And the Lord's been giving me many, many opportunities that I've been able to witness to people here locally in the local area. I've been able to preach the gospel to people, and I'm thankful for that, and I can't wait for the next time. And you say, well, I'm still kind of nervous and things. Keep reading the Word. Keep staying in the Word. Keep, keep you know, studying and studying and studying. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. You keep hiding God's Word in your heart, it's going to come out eventually. God's going to give you that boldness as you study His Word, as you show, Lord, I'm serious. I want, to, I want to be used of you. It will happen. I will guarantee it. Believe me, I was, you talk about shy growing up. I was very, very, very quiet. If you'd have told me I'm going to have an international ministry preaching the Word of God to people all over the planet, I'd be like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, I'm, what? You know, and, and able to do some street preaching now and then and, and you know, witness to people in person and things and and. I'd have never thought that was possible. But the Lord is enabling me to do those things because I'm serious about this book. I pray the same thing for you. Verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know the way that you're going to be able to do that? Is to stay busy about the things of the Lord. Again, I've talked about this. Uh, I had a study on this. Um, the thing about overcoming addiction. And I said that I don't believe that you can overcome an addiction by simply eliminating it. I believe that you have to overcome an addiction by replacing it with another addiction. If you're addicted to video games, become addicted to reading the Bible or hearing or watching sermons. Uh, if you're addicted to um, whatever, whatever you're addicted to, replace it with the things of the Lord. Just become addicted. Just devour this book. I mean, I, I see people that get newly saved or they come to the channel here and they're just like, I'm going to watch every video. It's going to take you a while, okay? we got over 800 videos now. I don't even know what the number is right now, but I mean, that's going to take you a long time. <laughs> but that's what you need to do. Become addicted to the Word. Become addicted to hearing preaching, okay? Uh, not just my channel. There are other channels out there, Bible-believing preachers. Um, become addicted to the Word. But we're going to end up here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You say, well, so then there are no signs at all that precede the rapture. You'll hear that. Well, that's not exactly true. There is one. And that's, this is the whole reason why I made this sermon. There is one. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1. We're going to read the whole chapter here. It's not very long. We'll get through it. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, Remember he wrote in his first letter about this? 
that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. What did Jesus say? That there would be a lot of deception in the end times? Yeah. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth, opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, the post-tribbers, Kent Hovind does this, uh, they will stop right there. They will not continue reading. And they'll say, see, that proves the falling away and the Antichrist is revealed before the body of Christ leaves. Uh-uh. you got to keep reading. See? They won't keep doing that. Very deceptive. That's because he's been deceived. I don't consider Ken Hovind to be an evil man or anything else. I believe that he's been very, very much deceived by some very false prophets. He uh, did not let any man deceive him by any means. He has been deceived by many means. <laughs> but uh, you see the thing there. There will come a falling away first. Now it's interesting because this sign, so to speak, these two things, the second part there, the man of sin being revealed, we're going to see here in a moment that that actually happens after the body of Christ leaves. I'll prove that. But the falling away happens, and we are seeing it. And what's the reason for the falling away? There's a lot of reasons, but I believe part of the big reason for a lot of the falling away is a lot of the brethren have been deceived by false rapture date setting. And you just get tired of it after a while, and you start to say, the New World Order's coming. They're, they're almost at the doorstep. They're going to come through my door soon. We're not going to get raptured. We're going to go through it. What happens? You fall away. Because you see, when you start to believe that Christians go into the time of Jacob's trouble, you start to get messed up doctrinally. You start to have to have questions about eternal security. You start to quote Matthew 24, 13, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You start to go into the faith and works thing. You get messed up. You fall away. And it's interesting because this one sign that is there, if you read through the Pauline epistles, he does give some signs for the end times, and guess what they're about? The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Hmm. It's all about professing Christians. You know, you can't say whether they're saved or not, but the, it's all about professing Christianity falling away. That's what it's about. The one sign that precedes the rapture is the falling away. And you'll see those prophecies given throughout, you know, the Pauline epistles about in the end that things are going to be, men shall be lovers of their own selves, ungrateful, proud, boasters, venters of evil things. Mm -hmm. But never once does Paul say anything about the sun and the moon being darkened and the earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars? And he doesn't say anything about that. Paul never warns anybody about don't take the mark of the beast. Well, man, if you, you know anybody that takes the mark and worships the beast, you know receives the wrath of God. If we're going to go through that, why wouldn't Paul warn? Why wouldn't Paul write something about that? Instead, he writes over in Ephesians chapter one and then again in chapter four that you're sealed unto the day of redemption. By God's Holy Spirit of promise. But let's continue. Now we're going to read the verses that the post tribbers don't read. Verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Who's the he? The Antichrist. Right there. The son of, or the man of sin, the son of perdition. Verse 3. He might be revealed in his time. Who's the his? Well, guess what? This time right now belongs to Jesus Christ. This is the time that he is making up his bride. The body of Christ is still on the earth. The Antichrist, he cannot be revealed in his time. The time of the body of Christ. Verse 7, let's look at this. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work the spirit of Antichrist. Only he who now letteth will let. What's the hindering there? The Holy Spirit. Why hasn't the United States fallen? 
Why are there still freedoms? Why can we still preach the gospel? Because He, the Holy Spirit speaking through us, is hindering. He is letting. As I've said, if you know anything about tennis, when they hit the ball and it whacks into the net, they say, let. What did it do? The net stopped the ball from going over to the opponent, to their side. That is letting. That's what your King James Bible word here is. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. A lot of people make the mistake of saying, well, the he being taken out of the way is the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. Not totally. The Holy Spirit in the, in the body of Christ. Okay, this he be taken out of the way is a reference to the body of Christ. All right, again, it's his time. We just read about that. Right now is the time of the church age. The body of Christ is still on the earth. So when the body of Christ leaves, okay, that special restraining of the Holy Spirit to keep the Antichrist at bay leaves with the body of Christ. Now the Holy Spirit's still going to be here in the sealed 144,000. There will be saints that get saved in the time of Jacob's trouble. Sure, sure. The Holy Spirit's not, you know, doesn't disappear. But that restraint of the Holy Spirit is what leaves. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Sure, absolutely. But that restraining, where he's holding back the evil. You know, I mean, you think that, oh, they passed sodomite marriage and they, they, they're they taking down Ten Commandments, you know, statues and things, and they're putting in Baphomet statues. <laughs> Crazy. You think it's bad now? Just wait till after the rapture. I'm glad I'm not going to be here. Wouldn't be much of a comfort there. Paul keeps saying, comfort yourselves, comfort yourselves, you know, about this stuff. Wouldn't be much of a comfort if we were going to go through this time. But let's continue. Until he be taken out of the way, verse 7, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Revelation 19. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and... Did you want to read it? Uh, S I G N S. Signs and lying wonders. So the signs have to wait until after the body of Christ leaves. What are we doing looking for uh, blood moons and uh, Hollywood putting 923 in its movies and and um, I think that the if you add up the dates of such, what are you doing? I think time the time has come, brethren, that we just say, you know what? I'm going to stay busy about the work of the Lord, and I don't care about rapture predictions. I don't care about setting a date. I don't care about saying, well, this is interesting, because if we look at this thing here, and if we look at that thing there, this could be the day. This could be the year and the day. I'm not saying it definitely is, but it could be the... The signs don't come until the body of Christ is left. The Jews require a sign. The time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 10, And with all deceivable... Er, yeah, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Receive love of the truth today. Change life through Jesus Christ. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, and that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Do you believe the book? I hope so. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Do you have the good word? Are you doing the good work? 
you know, I'll admit to some more guilt. I've been kicking myself a good amount here, and this sermon has been really convicting for me to put together. <sighs> there have been many times I've gone out in public, and I look at people, and I just get an attitude, and I'm just like, that person is just wicked, disgusting. Look at the way that they have their hair dyed, you know, red hair or some kind of thing, or piercings, tattoos, you know. Yeah, what a, probably a sodomite or devil worship. And, you know. and I'll tell you what, the Lord's been really convicting me of that. And they might be all those things. I'm, there's very wicked people out there, don't get me wrong. But you know what? That person has a soul. They can be witness to as long as somebody has breath and that they're still living, I realize there's a lot of people that are very close to not having that. Some of the zombies in this country, good night. But as long as somebody is still living here on this earth, they can be saved. I don't know when their heart becomes hardened. I don't know when they get to that point where it's just like they've heard the gospel, they've rejected the gospel, whatever, they're a child of wrath. I don't know. Witness to them. I have the good word. I need to continue in the good work. And the good work is not setting dates for the rapture. And getting all messed up with looking at the signs and what are the signs and what oh, what are the signs and all oh, the monthly signs and the and the Don't get drawn into it, brethren. I have for years and years and years. And uh there have been times my life has been downright miserable because I just didn't even care at all about keeping things going and just, you know, working for weeks and weeks and weeks on end and just, you know, got to get this done. I got to get that. Take some time and enjoy what God has made. Take some time and get out there and, and love the lost people. Show love towards them. You know, uh, that's, that's our motivation, brethren. Um, this time period that's coming, it's going to be bad. I mean, when the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is gone, I know, you know, one brother was writing me about this one time, and he said it just gets, I mean, you go out in public now, you come back, you feel like you need to take a shower. I mean, it's so, it's just so filthy. It's dirty. I mean, you go into these, I mean, grocery stores, and they're playing classic rock. They're playing heavy metal. You know, there's one in the area here that plays Metallica, Guns N' Roses and stuff like this. Satanic heavy metal I used to listen to when I was a lost man, professing Christian, but <laughs> yeah, sure, you know. It's so vexing. You know, you go and you hear young, you know, you hear children using profanity and you're going, what is, what is this, you know? And you, and you walk through the magazine aisle and it's like, okay, you know, <laughs> up, 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 you know, <laughs> tabloids and things like, oh, it's disgusting. This world is disgusting. But, you know, as I said at the beginning, there's still some mopping work to do. There's still some cleaning up that we have to do. Uh, and you know, some of it could actually be cleaning up your life, looking for those things that are not pleasing in the eyes of the Lord and saying, you know what, I need to clean that up. Because you see, when you rapture or when the rapture gets happened, what, <laughs> when the rapture happens, when you get raptured is what I'm trying to say, you're not going to have time to clean those things up anymore. The Lord's going to say, uh, why did you have that? Uh, well, Oh, you see, Lord, I, I listened to the music. I just, I didn't pay attention to the lyrics. It just, I had it there for the, uh, yeah. I mean, we've burned, my wife and I have burned, you know, thousands of dollars worth of stuff over the years. The Lord just convicts us, and I'm probably getting ready to do another purge of our belongings. Just going through and just saying, Lord, what about that? Is this innocent? Is this something okay? And whatever else, you know, sanctification. It continues right up until the day of the rapture. You know, again, I've I have uh, had varied interests over the years, reading and things like that, and uh, I've uh, read different books, guys that were in war and everything. And the one book I read, uh, it's probably over here. Yeah, um, that book right there, Silent Warrior. Not recommending it. You know, it's you know, it just I used it in different sermon illustrations. Maybe I should get rid of it. But uh, there was a I think it was that one. They were talking about sniper school, and um, they said that the way they would train snipers is that the gun, you focus in on the target. And, you know, I can't really, that's a sword that's, you know. But you're, you're focused in on the target, 
you know, and, and as you're, you know, a lot of times I got bipods, so they're like back here holding like this. And you keep your eyes focused on that target out there. You know, you focus on that target and you slowly pull the trigger, but you don't take your, you don't think about pulling the trigger. You keep your eyes focused on that target. And here's the key. When the gun goes off, it should surprise you. You know, that's a good picture of the rapture. When the rap rapture happens, what are you going to be doing? Are you going to be waiting for it because you uh, figured out the date? It's not possible, so don't bother. But, uh, or are you going to be like, uh, excuse me, I'd like to tell you about the Lord. You know, get a, these are old gospel tracks I did years ago. Made them on my computer. Are you good enough to get to heaven? And um, a quick and easy test. Wrote these things up. Takes people through the law. Convinces them that they're a sinner and that Jesus Christ died to save sinners. But, uh, you know, made these things many years ago. I still have a few of them around. But, would it be something? You're at a store someplace and you're going, I could put one on this bench here. Go lay it down. Come up hither. Huh? Boom. Up you go. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Or you're going to be on the internet looking at the latest from Infowars.com or, or some other thing that's uh, tracking the New World Order. Believe you me, brethren, I wasted many years doing that. And the Lord's really convicted me this year. Really, really convicted me. I'm not giving up hope in the rapture. I'm not giving up hope in the Lord Jesus Christ taking me out of here soon. Not going to happen. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to start to live better for the Lord. I'm going to start to try to witness more. I'm going to pray without ceasing that the Lord gives me more open doors to witness. My wife and I. So, that's going to be it. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for really uh, just convicting me of this subject. And, and uh, well, I'm sorry, Lord, for many, many wasted years looking, keeping my eyes on the enemy and not looking at the, the race that's set before me and running that race. But I just pray, Lord, that you would give me more opportunities to preach your word to people here in my area. And I pray for all the people watching this study, Lord, that they would also be convicted and know what areas need to be cleaned up and know what areas need to be fixed up in their lives and that they would not waste their time anymore with false rapture dates. And they wouldn't even pay any attention to that stuff, Lord, but they would be diligent about your work. And um, I just pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's going to be it. Like I said, this was a this was a rough one to put together for me. I'd oh boy, I just sat down at the computer a couple of times and went try to get the scriptures together, and it was just like you know, eh, convicting, very very convicting. And um, I don't know, you know, when the rapture is going to happen, but I do know that uh, we still got work to do, brethren. Be diligent about doing that work. So that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.